Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello, and welcome to our seventh annual Inspiration, Innovation, Impact Celebration of Graduate Students Research. Today is a celebration of some of the most outstanding research our graduate students are producing. And after two years of pandemic-related challenges, we are thrilled to be able to gather today and give our students an opportunity to present their research, scholarship, or creative activity to you, and it's in person. And, you know, I don't know about you, but um, my nephew got really confused at times during the pandemic. He said to me, you know, remember when I was growing up, uh, we were told to hang around with positive people? Then during the pandemic, we were told to hang around with only negative people. <laughs> And now he's totally confused because he doesn't know whether he should hang around with positive or negative people anymore. But, well, I'm so pleased to see all of you here today because I'm certain that you are positive about today's event, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. The applicant pool for this year's event was so impressive that we had a really hard time narrowing it down to just a few presenters. So in addition to the presenters that you'll hear today, uh, we'll have another group of equally impressive students who have recorded their presentations, and those are available online. Um, after today's event, we'll encourage you to follow the QR code in our program or visit our website um, to watch the virtual presentations. I assure you that you'll find them informative and engaging. Regardless of whether they're presenting in person or virtually, these students come from all across campus and many different programs, and they are simply remarkable. Um, at UNLV, we do have more than 175 certificates and programs, but all of our faculty and students have one common goal, and it is to solve complex problems that address individual, regional, national, and global challenges. The work of our featured student speakers focuses on everything from therapeutics for degenerative diseases of the brain to increasing the operational efficiency of small food and beverage businesses and to alleviating anxiety, depression, and stress in college students. So there's a whole range. Their work will inspire you, and it promises to make our collective future bright. Um, before we get started with the presentation, I'd like to recognize a few groups that are helping with today's event to make this a spectacular one. Uh, I'd like to thank the UNLV Honors Jazz Trio for providing us with a wonderful selection of music. Uh, the trio, yes, yes, thank you so much. Um, the trio features Patrick Hogan, who's playing the piano, Eduardo Lacata, who's playing the bass, and Zach Mejia on the drums. Um, thank you also to our graduate college staff with a special acknowledgement to the Graduate Academy team for putting this event together, and also to our grad rebel ambassadors who are volunteering today, so thank you so much. And a special thank you to Sue DeBella, who has worked with our students over the past few months to coach them so that they would be present, presentation ready today. So thank you so much, Sue, for your help in this. Um, I'll also like to take a minute to recognize the spring 2022 Graduate College Medallion recipients 
Um, the Graduate College Medallion is given to students who have been exceptionally involved during their time as graduate students at UNLV. Um, medallions are awarded in the semester in which students are graduating. So if you are um, one of our medallion students, please stand up when I call your name. Um, this med semester's medallion some, uh, recipients are uh, Salvador Amon. Almanaz, or, or Almanza, sorry, um, Business Administration, uh, Lina Charo from Electrical Engineering, Scarlett Iglesias Oils, yes, thank you. Iglesias Oils from Clinical Mental Health Counseling, um, George, good, yes, thank you, Scarlett. Uh, we have George William Kajamba from Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, we also have Jacqueline Parker King from Criminal Justice. Is Jacqueline here? No? He, okay, Catherine Pratt from Theater Arts. <laughs> yes. Good. And Maria Ramos Gonzalez from Mechanical Engineering. Yes, Maria. We have Miriam Mohidan Rod from Curriculum and Instruction. Okay, we also have Sean Reed from Criminology and Criminal Justice. Uh, Serena Scalzi from Curriculum Instruction also. Okay. Samantha Schaefer from Communication Studies. No? And Hui Ting Shi from Interdisciplinary Health Sciences. Is with you? and Hauja Tauri from Post-Professional Occupational Therapy. Congratulations to all of you. And thank you, and now we would like to play a special message from Nevada Senator Jackie Rosen. So let's hear from Senator Rosen. Hi, I'm Jackie Rosen, and I'm proud to represent you in the United States Senate. I want to thank the UNLV Graduate College for hosting this fantastic event. Graduate education and research have an incredibly positive impact on our society, and graduate students play an important role in our ongoing pursuit to better understand and improve the world around us. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize specifically the incredible work that you, the graduate students of UNLV, are doing. Your commitment and contribution to public good is so important now more than ever. Whether it's in the humanities, the hard sciences, or any other discipline, your desire to critically analyze some of society's most pressing questions will continue to lead to great advancements in our state and beyond. I have no doubt that you will use your education to create a more prosperous Nevada. This work is not easy, but it is vital, and I'm grateful for your interest and commitment. Thank you, and enjoy the event. Great. All right, thank you, Senator Rosen. And now I'd like to invite Nicole Thomas, who is our Graduate Professional Association, Student Association President, for a few words. Thank you so much, Dean Lynn. My name is Nicole Thomas. I am the president of the Graduate and Professional Student Association. Um, originally, I was supposed to come up with some eloquent remarks for this, but being a graduate student, I procrastinated a bit. Um, so I am here with you all, and I'm going to wing it. Um, because frankly, sometimes that's what research is. Um, way back in my day, about eight years ago, I started at UNLV as an undergrad. I was a first generation college student, and I I got involved with research my sophomore year, and it absolutely blew my mind. Um, I could not believe that I was able to actually like create things and create knowledge and discover new ideas. Um, that obviously set me up for graduate school because now I'm here eight years later in a PhD program. I am so incredibly excited to be here with you all today to just see the fantastic work that's happening here. I really missed being in person, being able to walk around and see just absolutely 
probably everything that's happening and reading the posters and chatting with people. And that's not something that you could really easily achieve anywhere else besides graduate school. So I am so incredibly excited to hear from every single one of you. I see so many friendly faces that I've communicated with via email. So like, it's so good to see you in person now and be like, hello, good to see you. Um, I'm honestly impressed with the level of scholarship that we have at UNLV. I think we are in a really unique place where we are able to work with genuinely, like, genuinely good faculty members who care about our work and our research. And it's clear that there are very many supporters in the audience who also care about those things. Um, I think UNLV is in a unique position where even though we are a large commuter campus, there is a campus culture of research and innovation. There is a campus culture of people caring about one another and caring about the creative and scholarly work that's going on here. I, for one, definitely do. So I very much thank you all for being here today with us. Um, I'm super excited to be able to invite you all to our annual GPSA Research Forum happening tomorrow. Same room, same place. Um, we will have free food starting at 11.45. However, if you want to come before the food, you could see wonderful presentations from all of our graduate students. We had over 120, um, over 120 presentations submitted which is more than any other year before, meaning that students want to talk about their work. Students want to share the amazing things that they're doing. Um, I, for one, definitely do. So I invite you all to attend tomorrow. I invite you all to enjoy the rest of the evening here. Um, and thank you. Thank you for letting me be here. And thank you for giving me um, the opportunity to speak with you all. So I would love to take this time to introduce one of my dear friends and colleagues, Nevena Svijicic. Um, she will be going through, I believe, introductions to all of the presentations. Thank you, Nevena. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nicole. Now, who's ready to hear some outstanding research happening on our very own campus? So, our first speaker is Kendra McLaughlin. Kendra is a fourth year PhD student in interdisciplinary neuroscience. Her presentation title is Boldly Going Where No One Has Gone Before, a novel approach to examining metabolic processes in the brain. Kendra. I've always found the intersection of both science and fiction to be one of the most mesmerizing forms of art. From tinkering with the delicate balance of time travel to venturing into a great unknown galaxy, anything seemed to be possible. It was in this realm where I witnessed the first African-American woman, Nichelle Nichols, play the role of a space traveler in the iconic series, Star Trek. As a young girl, watching someone that looked like me do extraordinary things opened my mind to what and who I could be. Years later, I found myself embarking on my own sci-fi adventure and boldly going where no man has gone before or at least no one in my family. I was admitted into UNLV's neuroscience PhD program, and it wasn't until after I began my own research on the brain's ability to produce energy that I saw that the line that separated science and fiction wasn't as definitive as I had once thought. Hi, my name is Kendra McLaughlin, and today I have the pleasure of navigating us on a sci-fi adventure through the brain. Now, some of you may still be a little skeptical as to whether energy dynamics of the brain are as cool as what we might see in a movie. Well, I'm here to tell you, they are. For instance, in the 1999 film Star Wars Episode I, they mentioned something called midichlorians. It was a microscopic life form that lived in symbiosis with a host and an important component to detect the energy field known as the force. In the film, one could actually measure the level of midichlorians within an individual to see how strong they were in using the energy field. The force, zoom, 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 is defined as an inner source of energy that powers all living things. And this is true for each one of us. The concept of a small organelle providing power doesn't just exist in Star Wars, but in the everyday life cycle of eukaryotic cells that make up all plants and animals. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, mitochondria, you know, the powerhouse of the cell. It's a small organelle that supplies fuel to meet cellular energy demands in the brain. 
Disruptions in mitochondrial dynamics have been implicated in many neuroinflammatory diseases of the brain, like multiple sclerosis, ALS, or Parkinson's disease. Lack of effective treatment options highlights the need to reevaluate diseased physiology in order to find novel therapeutic targets. Much of what we know about mitochondrial dynamics highlights the role of neurons. However, the metabolic impact of immune cells like microglia that are the first line of defense in the brain has still so much to be explored. This ultimately led me to ask what is happening to the mitochondria activity inside of microglia during disease states in the brain. To measure this, I will be looking at the mitochondrial membrane potential, or the MMP. Now, similarly to measuring the level of midichlorians within an individual, I've come up with a clever way to measure the activity of mitochondria inside of microglia. To do this, I've obtained living brain tissue from specialized mice that have glowing green microglia. And I've added on a fluorescent dye that allows me to see changes in mitochondria activity. I place it all underneath my microscope, and there I administered a toxin called LPS to create a disease state in the tissue. And in my first adventure, I wanted to see if there were any mitochondrial differences between neurons and microglia during disease. And what I saw was after the toxin was introduced, the microglial MMP had a significant increase that happened at three different time points. And it would happen much more dynamically in microglia, represented in green, than in the neurons, represented in blue. I had to take a closer look at each of these time points. It was way too cool not to. And what I saw was remarkable. The microglial MMP seemed to be moving. It was moving from the body of the cell all the way to the fingertips, also known as the end feet. I wanted to see if there was a way to somewhat rescue these cells that were under attack by adding a neuroprotective drug. And to my surprise, it worked. I was able to see a decrease in the microglial MMP at every region of the cell. Together, these results suggest that microglia might have their own signaling processes located at the end feet, and perhaps make this protocol a novel way to screen other neuroprotective drugs for inflammatory diseases of the brain. I never could have imagined that my innate love and curiosity for sci-fi adventure would have paralleled the captivating world of neuroscience. As I progressed through my graduate journey, the awe and excitement I once felt watching space travelers maneuver the stars is the same feeling I get when maneuvering my microscope. The ultimate goal of my research is to advance the way we understand energy metabolism in the brain and to use this knowledge to earlier diagnose neuroinflammatory disorders. And perhaps, along the way, inspire someone else to boldly go where no one else has gone, just as I once was. I'd like to thank Dr. Dustin Hines, Dr. Rochelle Hines, the Hines Group, and all of you for your time. Thank you so much, Kendra. So our next speaker is Cody Chris, a master's student in biological sciences. His presentation title is Insights into Bacterial Virulence from a Deadly Pathogen. Cody. I'll try to follow that. <laughs> Hi, today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about the work that our lab does to better characterize how a bacterial pathogen is able to cause disease. You see, uh, well first I want to acquaint you with some information that you might find shocking. Over the last two years, we've all witnessed the havoc that deadly microbes can inflict on our communities. Indeed, the COVID-19 virus has killed over six million people worldwide, and in the US, nearly a million of those deaths. But what you might be shocked to learn is that one of the leading causes of death is diarrheal diseases, which accounted for more than 1.6 million deaths in 2017 alone. Amongst children, there are about 1.7 billion cases every year, and for children under the age of five, diarrheal diseases are the second leading cause of death accounting for one in nine of all childhood deaths. One of the major contributors to this high death toll is a pathogen called Shigella, shown here on the left. 
Shigella are highly infectious bacteria that are spread through food and contaminated surfaces. The worldwide burden exerted by Shigella is estimated to be about 600,000 deaths and up to 165 million cases every year. In the US, Shigella is attributed with about $93 million in direct medical costs. And due to the rise of antibiotic resistance, Shigella has been designated by the CDC as one of the top 18 pathogens requiring attention right now. Unfortunately, there are no approved and effective vaccines against Shigella, and so we need to identify other ways to treat it, which we can do by understanding how it causes disease. You see, Shigella is able to cause disease due to a set of genes encoded in its DNA, and those disease-causing genes are called virulence genes. As shown on the right, the Shigella bacteria in red, when they are outside the body, these genes are normally kept off. But once inside the body, Shigella's virulence genes get turned on, and Shigella begins to invade and colonize the intestinal lining and destroy it, leading to dysentery. What we're interested in in our lab is how these genes get turned on. So what do we know? Well, let's zoom in on the DNA of Shigella. Shown here is a simplified schematic of a Shigella virulence gene. When Shigella is outside of the body, such as, oops, such as on your food, these genes are repressed or inaccessible because a silencer protein comes along and wraps up the DNA to block them. But then once inside your body, Shigella produces an anti-silencer that docks onto the DNA and then somehow is able to counteract that silencer to turn these genes on. What we don't yet understand is how that works. My project aims to figure out what, how this mechanism works and thereby better understand how Shigella is able to cause disease. Our lab has, through various assays and, and historical experiments, been able to propose two possible mechanisms for this activity. One of them is called spreading, and the other one is called bridging. In the spreading mechanism, that anti-silencer gets recruited to the DNA, it clamps down on it, and then it's interestingly able to slide along the DNA. And this opens up that region again, so that way more of this protein can continue to accumulate on the DNA that eventually disrupts that silencer to turn these genes on. So that's the spreading mechanism. Alternatively, this bridging mechanism, which is another idea we have, is it starts off similarly, that anti-silencer gets onto the DNA, but then instead it cross-links or connects to another copy of itself bound on the DNA. This bridge can lead to remodeling of the DNA structure that disrupts the silencer to turn these genes on. My project is aiming to elucidate which of these mechanisms we can attribute the anti-silencing activity to, to turn these genes on. And I'm doing this using well-established molecular biology and biochemistry methods. And I'll just add that some preliminary data recently actually suggests that both mechanisms are kind of involved. By characterizing how Shigella is able to regulate these virulence genes, we can better understand how it controls its ability to cause disease. But interestingly, the mechanisms of how Shigella is able to control its virulence genes are predicted to resemble the mechanisms that exist in other bacteria. And hence, the outcomes of my research extend well beyond Shigella and may lead to a better understanding of how other pathogens control their virulence genes as well. Ultimately, this work contributes to our fundamental understanding of topics in biology, but it also provides an opportunity to identify novel drug targets. This may lead to the development of therapeutics and strategies to help treat and fight against Shigella and other bacterial pathogens. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. So next up is Nikki Bennett, a PhD student in anthropology. Her presentation title is Direct-to-Consumer Canine Genomic Services, Evaluating Consumer Motivations, Perceptions, and Responses to Test Results. Nikki. So this is my dog, Skylar, and I adopted him two years ago. And like most people who adopt their dogs, I got a limited history because his owner had passed away. But what if I told you that there's actually a technology that exists that people are using to kind of fill this gap of missing information? Direct-to-consumer genetic test services are those in which you can purchase these tests without the need of a healthcare provider. We've all seen the commercials, right, 23andMe, where they tell you that you can learn your ancestry or you can learn about certain traits that your DNA may hold or even some health aspects. 
to give you context to how large this industry is, it's currently projected that the human genetic sector will be worth $31.8 billion and the animal sector $6.4 billion by 2027. Now to bring this back to the United States and to the direct-to-consumer industry specifically, it's currently valued at $340 million. Research into the market as to why people use these tests for themselves or how they respond to the test results has been extensively studied. But unfortunately, people who are using these tests for their dogs or their cats have yet to benefit from this type of research. This is even more surprising considering some important dates. For example, the dog and cat genomes were sequenced at the beginning of the 21st century. Even further, the first genetic test became available in 2007 for dogs. Two years later, they switched to the same direct-to-consumer model. And of course, cats are like always the afterthought, right? Like you don't even know they're in the room until they pop up. Um, so 2016, they finally got a test. So to fill this gap, colleagues and I collaborated with Wisdom Panel. And just so you know, this is the company who developed that first dog DNA test. We asked their existing consumers why they wanted to get their dog genetically tested. How did they perceive that experience? And also, how did they respond to their dog's test results? Another thing that I want to say that was important to us is to designate this as a pilot study, since this was such a novel area of exploration. When we asked people about what was their primary reason for having their dog genetically tested, 83% said they did it to learn their dog's breed. We also presented them with certain statements that are called Likert scale items. And when we said, I did this to learn about a dog that I have limited information on, 73% strongly, strongly agreed with this statement. When we evaluated their perceptions of the experience, they said that the results were trustworthy. 51% strongly agreed with that statement. But even further, we wanted to know how they perceived the utility of each individual test returned. So we asked them, do you think that the breed results are accurate? And 52% strongly agreed with this. But where it was a little interesting is that 46%, which was the majority of where they clustered, had no opinion about the health information that they received. So in responding to their test results, 97% of our participants said they responded by discussing their dog's test results with someone else, most often family and friends, with a little over half saying they did talk to a veterinarian. We asked them to tell us, well, what did you talk about? 91% said they shared their dog's breed result, and again, only 28% focused on the health aspects. Though to be fair, we asked them, what would you do if you had a question? And 77% said that they would talk to a veterinarian. This line of inquiry has broad implications in that numerous academics, such as myself, study the human-animal bond and all the factors that, it can, that can influence it. As I've mentioned, the veterinary care field is impacted by this industry because they're receiving test results that they can either choose to include their veterinarian or exclude their veterinarian. The industry can also benefit in that they can learn about detected consumer behaviors and patterns. And of course, not least, the consumers themselves can benefit. And I think it's worth saying how they can benefit is how all these agencies are connected. 
If veterinarians are talking to academics or the scientists behind this industry, they can learn about how these tests work. And then they can serve as a point of contact for those consumers who may have questions. Even further, if the industry is talking to veterinarians or academics, they can learn about possible indirect uses of these tests and develop outcomes to develop interventions to prevent negative outcomes. And for those wondering, no, I have not used one of these tests yet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. So our next speaker is Shivangi Karanya, a master's student in hotel administration and management information systems. Her presentation title is Building Better Businesses, Rebels Make It Happen. Shivangi. Did you know how hard it is to sustain a business in the food and beverage industry? Well, statistics show that about only 20% businesses succeed in the first five years of being in operations. There's about 2.5 small family-owned and operated businesses here in the United States. And it's quite sad that only 20% of them get to succeed. I personally think that this is not fair. Um, now you might be wondering why am I so passionately advocating for these small business owners and their lack of opportunity to be able to succeed in the industry. Well, the story goes back to spring 2020 when I first started grad school. I started my first class as um, in the e-commerce class and our group and I were tasked with a project to say, well, go find a problem for a very specific industry and then go find a solution for it and create a business plan. So that's exactly what I did. Happened to be that I saw my friend Jacob that evening. My friend Jacob is a chef at a three mission star restaurant here in Las Vegas, and I was attending his underground pop-up in his apartment to support him. Well, his biggest challenge was that he couldn't find a business partner where he could really go and test his, com like his concept and his business. So I took it upon myself to try and solve his problem, and I took it to my group where we created the solution of an Airbnb version of a kitchen rental com site. This, the project was called Sue Kitchen, and we ended the class with flying colors. I mean, our professor loved the project, and I ended up getting out of the class even more passionate about this project than I thought I was gonna. I was so passionate that my family and my uncle decided to invest in my business that wasn't even created yet. And he was like, well, I'll give you money. Just go and start this business. And I was like, uh, I'm just a grad student. I don't know how to start this business. So I ended up contacting the Trost Center of Entrepreneurship at UNLV and Matt Leith, who runs the department. And after meeting him, Leith gave me an even harder challenge and was like, well, go and talk to 100 business owners and find what their challenges are and then come back to me when you do that. Well, two and a half months later, I had contacted and spent time with about 60 business owners and understood what their challenges really were. And this was in the midst of pandemic, so I felt like I was acting like their therapist, to be very honest. But shortly after, I ended up finding my co founding my company. My company is named Udesso, and my first product was a space sharing matchmaking platform. Think about Airbnb and a dating app, and if they had a baby, that's exactly what it looked and felt like. <laughs> well, the goal was that, the goal of this app was to bring the community together and help the community in the food and beverage industry realize that there was creative ways for them to expand their business, increase their ROI beyond just kitchen rentals, and partner together so they can all rise together. In a month and a half, I ended up helping about 40 businesses grow. And I knew that there was a product market fit because these businesses started to wanting to almost throw money at me because how much I help them. Well, think about a juicery and a meal prep company. And if they met together and became roommates, that's exactly what happened in one of the examples. And they expanded their business, increased their ROI, and now they're doing ghost kitchen concepts together. Not only that, a brunch only restaurant in the morning and a dinner concept at nighttime. So we were playing around and being very creative. But 
I found myself into another challenge. After helping these businesses grow, I did not know how to keep them in my ecosystem. They were just happily ever after, and my services were well used. But I wanted to keep them in my ecosystem so I can grow my company and strategically plan it so I can expand it nationwide. So I went back to my customers, and I started picking their brains again to understand exactly what their problems were and how they operated their business. So after interviewing quite a few businesses again, I found out that the path of sustaining a business could be quite complex, anywhere from finding the perfect product market fit to making sure that their licenses are compliant at all times along with their employee licenses and permits. Not only that, they had to make sure that their buildings were maintained and compliant along with making sure vendor relations, payroll, labor management, and the list goes on and on until they reach the finish line. And for a small family-owned small business owner, they do it all by themselves. So I took it upon myself to say, OK, let me create product number two. And product number two is called Pepper. The goal of Pepper is to help streamline a lot of compliance-related tasks and bridge the gap between government agencies and small business owners. Pepper helps small business owners automate license renewal between all the states, jurisdictions, and the health department. Not only that, Pepper helps automate the compliance and reminder aspect for business owners to maintain their building compliance and their equipment compliance, along with making sure that all their employees are compliant at all times. Not only that, Pepper helps business owners get reminded about all the grants and funding opportunities that become available in their state and the jurisdictions that they're that they have their business in. Well, I hope and I personally hope that as I grow this business, I'm able to help small business owners streamline processes so they can be efficient in a more cost-effective way so they can focus on what they truly love and why they really started their business in the first place um, so that all of us can rise together as a community and make an impact. Lastly, I'm working on a very cool partnership and I hope that it goes through. It's a partnership with Clark County and this partnership would give me access to over 23,000 businesses so that in the food and beverage industry alone so I can offer my product to the masses and help change the way and how businesses are run. Um, I know I have a long way to go, but with the help of UNLV and all the resources that are always surrounding me and supporting me, I can truly say that Rebels make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Shivangi. Next up is Dustin Davis, a PhD candidate in interdisciplinary health sciences. His presentation title is This Place, This Moment. Dustin. I'd like for you to imagine just for a moment that you're in this place, in this moment. You're crossing a busy intersection, maybe it's Maryland and Tropicana, and you see these cars creeping toward you just waiting for that green light. You smell toxic exhaust fill your nostrils and the wind of cars whipping behind you just smacking your body. Now imagine yourself in this place, in this moment. There are no cars anywhere, sun beaming down on you, cool breeze, and I'm asking you this question. Do these places and moments feel different to you? They undoubtedly do, because you are seeing, smelling, feeling, hearing different sensations. These are just four of the five sensations, the fifth being taste. And these sensations affect what we think and what we feel emotionally. All of these things together make up what's called our inner experience. And we all have an inner experience every moment of every day. We're having one right now. In fact, we have this ability as humans to not only think about the now, like what's going on around us, but also to reside in a couple of other areas, like the past and the future. We're so good at this as a species that we actually reside here most of the time. We're thinking about the past, maybe ruminating, or we're planning for the future. So we spend our area, our time in these areas out on the fringes, but we have the ability to come back to the now, and that's pretty unique as humans. And we can do that through mindfulness. 
Now, mindfulness is kind of airy. It's hard to really get your, eye, you know, your head around. But I have taken the definition from the research and kind of put it into one word. It's called mama, a word that we are all pretty familiar with. And it actually is breaking the definition down into maintaining awareness moment by moment with acceptance. So this is our definition, and we can do it in a lot of ways. We don't have to be sitting on the floor, cross-legged, candles lit all around, low light, music playing. We can do it like this while we're drinking a cup of coffee, looking out the window if we're paying attention to the aroma and to the taste. And so that's just to give you an idea that we can be mindful in any moment. And some people train in this. It's called mindfulness training. And there are a lot of benefits of it, actually. The research shows that you can improve your well-being, your sleep. You can also improve your anxiety, depression, and stress. And you know, there's this other thing that we hear about all the time that we're supposed to do that can help with a lot of these things. It's called exercise. And it's really hard to do consistently, but regular walking is just one form of exercise and it has its own benefits, like improving heart health, like lowering our risk of early death, also improving anxiety and depression. So my research comes at the intersection of these two interventions. It's looking for a synergy between mindfulness training and walking. And that synergy is called mindful walking, where we maintain our awareness moment by moment with acceptance while we walk. And I'm really interested specifically in doing this in nature. So outdoor areas like this, you can see a couple that are around our area. We have the Wetlands Park, and then we also have a place not far from Cedar City, Utah, which is the Thunderbird Gardens Trailhead. And early research by my advisor, Dr. James Navalta, has found that students who walk outdoors in areas that kind of look like this actually feel calmer and more comfortable than when they walk indoors in a lab or outdoors in an urban area like around campus. So that's why I'm focusing on mindful walking in these areas. And so my research is kind of in this middle area. We're trying to work our way through it as all research goes. And I've done some trial runs, and what I've learned is that it's really hard to measure mindfulness uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, it involves big questionnaires that are clunky, and people miss questions, and you lose the data. And as a researcher, I can tell you, losing data is uh, one of the most frustrating things. You know, we've all been there as researchers where we lose the data and we have to kind of start from square one. So what I'm hoping to do is to figure out if we can develop new measures of mindfulness, specifically ones that are shorter and simpler, quicker, which is really nice when you're asking someone to respond during exercise because they don't want to fill out 20 questions while they're doing whatever they're doing. And so here is one example of the measure. What's, the whole measure is called the visual analog scale, and I'll explain what it is. It's a 100 millimeter line, and you mark on the paper where, that, where you feel it is. And I'll show you in just a moment. But the question that participants first read is, from moment to moment, I noticed and accepted my thoughts, feelings, bodily sensations, and environment without judging them. Then they read, how well does the sentence describe your experience over the last 10 minutes? And then here's the visual analog scale. It's a 100 millimeter line. The left anchor, the line running up and down on the left side is not at all like my experience. And the right anchor is exactly like my experience. Participants mark somewhere in between those two anchors how they feel. And we measure the distance from the left to that mark and say it's 70 millimeters. We compare that to the score on the questionnaire that's long and clunky. And we're trying to see if our new measure matches what the accepted measure already says. And so that's really where I'm at. What I hope to do if we can validate these easier and simpler measures is to run trials of efficacy where we're trying to see what, does the, what is the effect of regular mindful walk on things like anxiety, stress, depression. And so that's where I'm headed. Now, I'm really looking at undergraduate students, or hoping to, because they are actually the most anxious and depressed of all people in the United States. And so I'm really looking to find a non-medicinal way to help these students who need the help, especially over the global COVID-19 pandemic, as we've all seen. So what my advisor, Dr. Navalta, and I are doing are really exploring off the beaten path. We're some of the few in the world to be studying mindful walking, specifically outdoors. And I'm really excited to see what we find about this intervention in people who need it very badly, which is those undergraduate students. If you walk away with nothing else from today's talk, I hope it's that you feel motivated to think a little bit more about your now and take yourself out of the past 
or the future and come back to now and maybe even get out and explore some of the beautiful areas around Las Vegas, such as one like this up on Mount Charleston. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dustin. So up next is um, Hannah Pattonod, a PhD student in radiochemistry. Her presentation is titled The Rhetoric of Nuclear Power and the Power of Nuclear Rhetoric. Hannah. In our age of climate crisis, we are desperate for a clean, reliable source of energy. Nuclear energy is a strong contender, but struggles to maintain a spot in the lineup as it falls under the shadow of weapons, poor waste management, meltdown accidents, and ultimately the state of nuclear rhetoric. While I spend most of my time playing with uranium in hopes of saving the world with advanced nuclear technology, I know that what I do in my lab coat can only go so far unless I'm able to talk about what I do and explain why it matters to me to anybody who's willing to listen. For that reason, I've begun to study scientists' perspectives through the lens of social sciences, specifically communication studies. In 2018, I conducted a series of interviews with nuclear experts across the United States to explore what they think of nuclear energy and how they make sense of their roles as scientist citizens. Four primary themes emerge from these discussions, the first being risk and safety communication and subsequent perceptions of that risk, the role of government and policymaking on where the nuclear industry directs their efforts, the value of public education and engagement in nuclear decision making, and ultimately the gatekeeping nature of cost and fiscal limitations on the development of new plants and, and maintenance of old ones. Some interviewees approach these topics with a one-way or monologue perspective, while others valued multi-directional or dialogue approaches to these discussions. Opinions were not homogenous within the group, as no one was fully monologue or dialogue, nor did all of the experts agree within any one particular topic. I plan to continue this work through industry-wide surveys that can better explore these perspectives in hopes of ultimately being able to provide everyone within both the technical and public spheres with a seat at the table. One expert stated that generally scientists are well trusted, but when it comes to nuclear, there's mistrust. So how can we begin to build that trust back? Perhaps by being able to equip these experts with tools that will allow them to begin having these important discussions in ways that they can approach both confidently and compassionately with any audience. For this reason, I have constructed a nuclear communication certificate that can provide those tools. We discuss Aristotle's artistic proofs that include ethos, or your overall credibility and trustworthiness as a speaker, pathos, your ability to use ethical emotional appeals, and logos, or your use of logic in the form of context that's meaningful. We discuss the value of personal narratives and storytelling, not to just convince, but instead be able to explain complex concepts and find shared values that can help them develop interpersonal relationships and ultimately build trust. We explore the spheres of argumentation and how they can serve as bridges between these spheres where the translation of technical information to the public occurs and also the integration of public perceptions in technical scientific decision making. Most broadly, we are teaching these experts about the importance of the history of nuclear on modern perceptions. Specifically, nuclear technology's birth in the Manhattan Project, repeated power plant accidents, problems with the nuclear fuel cycle like Yucca Mountain, and now its role in combating the global climate crisis. It's imperative that they understand the role and relationship between nuclear and justice as being key to building a brighter future for everyone. It's my hope that we can encourage nuclear experts to strive for justice for people, 
for the planet and for clean power production. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. So next up is Howard Hamilton, a master's student in economics. His presentation title is, Do Solar Panels Increase Your Home Values in Southern Nevada? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Howard Hamilton. I'm with the Economics Department, and I'm going to be talking to you about solar panels today and their effect on your home value. And before I begin, I'd like to thank my advisor, Dr. Sa, who's helping me on this project. Now, let me begin with this question. Has anybody ever been to Morocco here? Oh, wonderful. The rest of you, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> Tell them. <laughs> But I'm originally from Morocco, and on my last visit uh, over there, it was the first time I went to the desert. And we visited the, this nomadic uh, village, and notice how they're using solar panels. They have these portable solar panels that they use for cooking, for even charging their cell phones. Nomads nowadays have cell phones. So, uh, and these people, you know, they move every 10, 15 days to, di to different locations. So th that just, you know, attracted my attention. Then we went to another village, the picture on the right, and you see that they have this solar panel. Now, mind you, this village doesn't even have roads. They don't have running water. It's, uh, Morocco is a big country, so uh, some, some areas are still underdeveloped. But that solar panel is their window to modernity and to comfort. With it, sometimes they don't even get propane gas on time. So with it, they can cook. They can have enough energy to power for their kids to do their homework at night. And I started noticing on my way back that there is this grassroots movement all over the country where people are putting these solar panels. And it reminded me of when my grandma, as a little kid, they used to tell me when the first time they got TV, that everybody was getting that TV because the neighbor got it, or because the cousin, or because some other family member. So that's, that just sparked my interest. Then when I, uh, and, and even this grassroots movement has pushed the government to start building these solar farms all over the country to, uh, generate power for the local population. So I was like, when I came to the United States, I was like, why is it that people don't have that same enthusiasm? Now you see people installing solar panels here and there, but there is not that solar, uh, th there is not that enthusiasm about, that I've seen in Morocco. And we know that 90% of Americans, they do favor going to solar um, as a source of energy. There's also strong bipartisan in both chambers of Congress for it. The only difference is how to implement it and how fast to go about it. So when I was talking to homeowners, the main thing that struck me was that they were thinking of it as a big investment. You're in, it's like buying a new car. And the other thing is, People thought about it as an investment, a home improvement investment. So I was, I, I, I took that idea and I ran with it. I said, let me, let me study this problem as a home improvement investment. And people usually, when they improve their home, they expect the value to go up. So uh, I went to the. Um, Realtor Association collected some database about 140,000 home sales. I don't know if you guys know it, but every time you put your house on the market, your realtors put a lot of data on it, um, like the listing price, the asking price, the first asking, the second asking price. There are so many comments. It's so funny sometimes you can go through those comments and just read like complaints of the sellers or the buyers or whatever, because that's how they communicate. The only problem I found with that database is that they don't have um, solar panels on them. They didn't identify them. It's something new that people, uh, some realtors just started doing it in the last two years. 
So I had to find a way to find another data, which I did by going to the local municipalities. Uh, luckily, to install a solar panel, you have to have um, a permit. So there are three municipalities here in Southern Nevada, and it's, um, so I went to Henderson, North Las Vegas, and the city of Las Vegas. Collected both databases, had to do a lot of cleanup. It's a lot of extra fat that I didn't need, a lot of information, I didn't need those comments. Merged them together, then I developed this uh, program, statistical program to do the analysis. And think of it as a super calculator, where you're gonna take all that fa final data, and it's gonna break the price based on different variables, square footage, bedrooms, numbers of bathrooms, even if you have different uh, amenities in the house, like a pool or a spa. And um, it, it was amazing, you know, it's like having a Google go into a search engine and put in how much would the price change if I add a room or take out a room or whatever. And uh, I was very excited because it, the findings showed a 5% increase in the value of the property, which um, if we compare it to the current average price of homes, which is $400,000 now, and it's still going up, as everybody know, it's, uh, it comes to $20,000. And I'm excited because nobody has ever done this in Nevada. Nobody has ever um, you know, done the research uh, surprisingly, in sunny state like Nevada. So to circle back to the original idea, are solar panels worth it? You know, from the problem, how I tackled it, does it add value to your home? Well, without even thinking about the savings on your electrical bill, without thinking about the environmental, you know, cost and, and, and going green, you know, just by themselves, solar panels on average cost $12,000. So they do pay for themselves because they add a value of 20000 Technically, just by looking at that problem, they do pay for themselves. So in my research, the answer was yes. And let me just finish by this uh, beautiful picture of our beautiful campus here at UNLV. This building is the Greenspan Hall. It's one of the newest buildings that UNLV has built, and it's a self-sustaining building. UNLV is one of the leading schools in the country for going solar and using green energy, and actually it saves up to $130,000 per year on its electrical bill, but just using solar. So um, I'm excited that I, I was able to find one piece of information to give to the consumer out there to help them make a better decision decision whether to acquire solar or not. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Howard. So lastly, we have Skylar Schock, a Masters of Fine Arts student in Theater Arts. Her presentation title is Laugh Until You Cry. Well, keep it going for yourselves for coming out tonight and for your wonderful speakers you've heard so far. That's it, that's the best we can do, clapping. Uh, as you just heard, my name is Skylar Schock and I'm currently earning my master's degree in performance, or as I like to call it, a socially acceptable way for my parents to tell their friends that I'm an actor and a stand-up comic. <laughs> in fact, when I got ready to do today's presentation, I met with the incredible team and at the very first meeting they said, great, can we see your PowerPoint? And I stood up and I went like this. <laughs> And I held it, and I held it, and I held it for a little bit longer, and then finally someone asked, um, what was that? And I explained that that was a PowerPoint, and they said, no, 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 we meant a slideshow. And I said, oh, I don't have one of those. Usually if I see a slideshow, I think I'm in the wrong room. So, <laughs> so then they explained to me that it would be best if I told all of you today that I was going to be doing a little bit of stand-up comedy as a part of my set. So I said, great, you want me to educate the most educated room of people I've ever talked to on laughing. <laughs> Can do, got it. Uh, so today I'm gonna tell you very quickly a little bit about why you laugh. I'm gonna tell you about why it matters to me and what I'm planning to do about it. 
Oh, there I am again. Uh, so comedy is really, really subjective, right? Like just ask Chris Rock. And um, no one can say for sure what makes someone laugh, but we have a pretty good idea on how to structure a joke to, to mo more likely get some laughter, and that's called a laugh trigger. So a couple laugh triggers. The first one is called surprise. And in, in this type of a joke, you want to structure it so you're misdirecting the audience. Uh, I recently tried to end it with the most toxic man in my life. Trader Joe. So yeah, you've heard of him as well. Uh, uh, another form of a comedic, uh, another form of a laugh trigger is called comedic irony. So the only time I've ever been offered drugs was at a cop's house. That's a true story. So <laughs> one of the most popular forms of laugh trigger is simply recognition. And that's just the idea that you laugh because you understand it relates to you. You've been there before, right? Uh, and this one is actually the most important to me because it inadvertently inspired the very event that I'm here to talk about. So last December, I had spent several weeks at home with my family. And I came back, and I hosted a comedy set at Wise Guys Comedy Club. And I was testing out some new material. I'd been home with my family, right? I get, up, I get back, and I test out this joke. I said, having a relationship with a family member as an adult is a lot like being in a relationship with someone you wish you would have broken up with years before. Everything about the person drives you crazy, but you have too many inside jokes to call it quits, right? My family and I just see the world completely differently. I see them as mentally unstable, and they think I spend too much money. And I said that joke, and it was funny to me. Uh, some of you didn't laugh, but uh, I, I didn't realize at the time I said that joke, and there was a family member I was specifically referring to when I told this joke, and I didn't realize that about three weeks from this set, that specific family member would have an actual, very severe mental breakdown resulting in their hospitalization. And it was um, a pretty painful experience for myself, my family, and that family member, and I didn't know that what I was doing was using comedy as a way to not just process what I was going through, but as a way to start a conversation about it. Because the first time I laughed and the first time my family laughed, we knew we were going to be okay. And so to me, I thought, huh, that's what comedy at its very best can do. Comedy can serve as a place to start a conversation and create community and connection in a room and give us a place to address difficult conversations, right? So I'm producing an event called Laugh Until You Cry, a one-of-a-kind stand-up comedy experience that mixes the entertainment of stand-up comedy with a talk back with the audience so that we can, in the room, create a, an opportunity to just have conversations and talk about why we laugh. Because the moment we all laughed in here together, we became a little bit closer, right? So thank you. Uh, it is important to know uh, I'm not a doctor or a scientist or even close to that. The, close to, the closest I'll ever be is like playing one on TV. Uh, so as we structure this event, I really and truly want it to be a powerful uh, experience, but I know that I need help to do that. So we plan on talking with a bunch of experts to design the proper format for a group uh, and community-based event like this. Uh, we also we're going to work to create the right stand-up comics who specifically can address topics that'll help us as an audience bring together a diverse group of people and a diverse group of topics to address. And along the way, as we produce this specific event, we're going to actually document the process, create a documentary of our journey uh, so that we can hopefully create a platform that other communities can use to produce their own Laugh Until You Cry events. Now, I obviously don't have time to go through the whole thing with everyone right now, but I I did want to give you all a very small example of what this could look like. Now, I've spoken with a few of you in this room, and I know that when I ask this question, there will be at least one person who raises their hand, but I have a feeling it might be more. So I made a joke a few minutes ago that uh, was my way of processing a loved one going through a mental health issue. And if you have ever had someone in your life that you've cared about, or you yourself have had to deal with a mental health issue and not had the right words to talk about it, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand in just a minute, OK? Do you think we can do that? I think you can. So if that statement resonates with you, could you please raise your hand? Take a look around the room. 
and just know that when you walk out the door, you're a little bit closer to everyone in here, and it was comedy that did it. So thank you all so much, and I'll hopefully see you soon. Thank you, Skylar. So let's hear it for this year's iCube speakers. They all did a tremendous job and have all earned a $1,500 scholarship. So now I'm going to hand it back to Dean Emily Lynn for a few announcements. Thank you, and thanks, Nev. And uh, I think I need to join Skylar's program. <laughs> Very nice. So thank you so much to all the presenters for the incredible, important work that you're all doing. And thank you so much for sharing with us today. It gives me great hope and confidence that our future is in such capable hands.